Hello and welcome back to Product Chronicles, the channel where we explore the rise and fall of the software that was supposed to change everything, but mostly just confused everyone. Today we are diving into a product that was announced like it would reinvent email, messaging and collaboration all at once, and then quietly vanished, leaving behind a trail of buzzwords, baffled users and one of the most spectacular product flops in Google's history. This is the story of Google Wave, a product that was way ahead of its time and also way ahead of what users could actually understand. If you're a product manager, startup founder, UX designer or just some one fascinated by why some products skyrocket and others crash and burn, this video is for you. We'll look at how Wave was born, what it was trying to solve, where it went wrong and what modern builders can learn from this ambitious failure. So buckle up, because this isn't just a story about Google, it's a story about vision, timing, user empathy and the brutal cost of skipping product market fit. Let's rewind to 2009, the iPhone was exploding, Facebook had just introduced the like button and Google was still mostly known for search and Gmail. Enter Google Wave. It was introduced at Google I.O. in May 2009 with a legendary hour-long demo, the crowd was hyped, engineers were blown away, tech media declared in the future of communication. Why? Because Google Wave promised to replace email, instant messaging, wikis and collaboration tools, all in one app. It let multiple people edit a wave in real time with live typing, rich media and branching conversations. It was the brainchild of Lars and Jens Rasmussen, the same brothers who built Google Maps. They pitched it as what would email look like if it were invented today. Wave was built on an entirely new communication protocol and had a custom-built front-end interface that allowed for live, concurrent updates. It was ambitious in every sense, and internally it had executive sponsorship from Google's leadership, including then-CEO Eric Schmidt, who called it one of the most exciting products he'd seen. What's often overlooked is how much of an internal gamble it was. A wave wasn't part of a broader product strategy, it was a side bet with no clear roadmap to monetization or integration into Google's broader ecosystem. Spoiler, apparently if you reinvent email, chat, docs and forums all at once, what you get is a chaotic mess of blinking cursors, nasty replies and sounding people typing at once, but we'll get there. The team behind Wave wasn't solving a clear user pain point, they were trying to reimagine communication from scratch. The idea was bold, maybe too bold. As a product manager, here is your first red flag. When your elevator pitch starts with we are replacing five apps with one, you are probably creating a Frankenstein, not a product. Wave was packed with features, real-time collaboration, inline comments, playback of edits, you could replay a conversation like a movie, drag and drop file sharing, robots, yes, bots in 2009 that could participate in your conversations. There were even APIs that allowed developers to create their own bots and extensions. The platform was meant to be extensible, a kind of proto-platform as a service layered on top of communication. It was trying to be the OS of the collaborative web, but even with all this power, it lacked a single compelling job to be done. It didn't ask, what do people hate about current tools, instead it asked, what if we reinvented all of them simultaneously? It was the software equivalent of building a spaceship before asking if users just needed a better car. Can I help you? Inside Google, a wave was treated like a moonshot, the team was isolated, ambitious and engineering led classic Google X-style projects. They had a small elite team and almost no PM discipline, no iterations, no MVP, just a massive, over-engineered version 1. This is what we call falling into the build trap, spending years building something without validating with users. They were so in love with the tech that they skipped the boring stuff, onboarding, positioning, feedback loops. The team worked in near secrecy for over two years. They built a new protocol, a Wave Federation protocol, a custom UI engine and complex real-time synchronization logic. These weren't small feats, they were solving serious technical problems that no one had really asked them to solve. Internally, there were debates about whether Wave should be consumer-first or enterprise-first. Instead of choosing, they went for both. The result? It didn't resonate strongly with either. There was no iterative validation loop, no dog fooding outside the team. 
no controlled release when we finally launched it did so with massive expectations and almost no user understanding. The irony? Google had built a phenomenal backend for a product no one knew how to use. How does it, um, how does it work? Let's talk UX. A wave was a UI disaster. It was doing too much and doing it all at once. You had conversations within conversations, replies inside replies, messages changing in real time when you were reading them. For power users, maybe cool, for 99% of humans, anxiety in using. The interface had no progressive disclosure, everything was visible, everything editable, everything live. There was no clarity of purpose, no UX hierarchy and no onboarding. Messages could be edited after sending, causing total chaos in linear conversation flow. Threading was inconsistent, notifications were noisy, and the color-coded cursors of multiple collaborators created a disorienting blue. It wasn't just hard to use, it was cognitively exhausting. Users spent more time trying to understand what was happening than actually communicating. Google Wave completely disrupted the mental models users had built over years of digital communication. Think about email. It's linear. You send a message, you get a reply, and everything stacks in a nice chronological order. Wave. It turned that into a branching mess where replies could happen inside any part of your message at any time. Imagine editing a sentence while someone is already replying to it, confusing, right? Now take chats. We are used to chat being fast, temporary, even disposable. You say something, it scrolls away. Wave preserves everything like an overzealous historian. Permanent, editable, searchable. There was no such thing as a fleeting message. And documents? Most tools like Word or Google Docs are structured. Headers, paragraphs, formatting, they give you a sense of control. Wave was freeform chaos. It lets you drop media, bots, replies, and edits anywhere. It felt more like digital graffiti than documentation. This all made Wave powerful, but also fundamentally incompatible with how most users think and behave. And when your product fights user intuition at every turn, you are not empowering them, you are exhausting them. The fundamental UX mistake? They asked users to relearn too much, too fast, and gave them zero handrails. Please, 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 please. Wave didn't just suffer from poor UX, it also had terrible timing. It launched into a world that simply wasn't ready, not technologically, not culturally. Email was still the undisputing king of workplace communication. Everyone used it, everyone understood it, and more importantly, everyone was trained to tolerate its chaos. Replacing it wasn't a feature upgrade, it was a cultural shift. Slack? It didn't exist yet. The idea of a chat-first workplace tool wouldn't enter the mainstream for another four years. So, Wave was pitching a problem users hadn't felt yet. Zoom wasn't a thing either. Remote work as we know it was still in its early days. So real-time digital collaboration, especially with multiple people typing at once, felt more noble than necessary. Google Docs? It was just starting to go mainstream. People were still wrapping their heads around the idea of shared live documentations. The idea of shared, editable, nasty chat doc hybrids? That was about five steps too far. And social chat apps like Facebook Messenger hadn't yet exploded. The behavior of casual, fast, multi-threaded messaging hadn't permitted consumer life. In short, a wave dropped into a world that didn't have the pain, habits or tools to support what it was offering. It was a visionary trying to speak to a room that didn't ask a question. And instead of integrating into these workflows, Wave demanded replacement. It wasn't compatible with Outlook, it didn't talk to Gmail, it couldn't be exported easily. Even worse, its closest competitors were its own siblings, Gmail and Gchat, both of which were lighter, more intuitive and deeply embedded in users' lives. Enterprise IT teams didn't know how to categorize Wave. Was it chat? Was it content collaboration? Was it a CMS? Meanwhile, average users didn't know what problem it solved. Power users tried it, got overwhelmed and never came back. The drama is sometimes a little bit overwhelming. Google officially shut down Wave just over a year after launch in 2010. Usage was abysmal, engagement dropped like a rock, even Googlers stopped using it. The team attempted pivots, smaller waves, enterprise versions, integration into docs, but none stuck. 
the codebase was too complex to evolve quickly and no PM wanted to own it. Publicly, they said Wave wasn't getting the traction we'd hoped for. Internally, it was a post-mortem case study. There were memes, tweets, articles, title, things like Google Wave, a failure of communication or Google Wave goodbye. Eventually, some of the core technology was open-sourced and handed over to the Apache Foundation, where I died a second quite a death as Apache Wave. Even Google's internal teams stopped using it. It was simply too confusing. Wave didn't crash because it was bad tech. It crashed because it was an answer without a question. Here is where it gets valuable, Google Wave is a masterclass in what not to do as a product team, and these aren't just work lessons, they are core product principles they missed, ignored, or bypassed entirely. First, innovation on its own isn't enough. You can build something brand new, groundbreaking, technically impressive, and still have no value. Because being new doesn't mean being needed, and Wave proved that in real time. The engineering was brilliant, but it wasn't solving a real problem that users had. Second, Wave skipped early validation. No lean MVPs, no user testing loops, no quick iterations. They built a spaceship, launched it with a standing ovation, and only then asked, wait, where are we going? In real product work, you test small, learn fast, and adapt constantly. Third, instead of asking what are people struggling with right now, the team asked what could we build with this tech. That's the wrong starting point. A good product is born at the intersection of user pain and technical feasibility, not in a vacuum of invention. Of course, they ignored how people actually think and work. The UI was alien, the mental models were broken. If your interface feels like decoding a foreign language, it won't matter how powerful it is. Most users will quit before they discover the magic. If they try to do too much from day one, Email, chat, collaboration, documentation, all in one tool, but when you build a product that tries to solve everything, it rarely does any of these things well. It becomes bloated, confusing, and unimaginable. And finally, they didn't prioritize onboarding. Even the most powerful product needs to be approachable. A wave threw users into a sandbox of endless options and expected them to figure it out alone. There was no guided setup, no success path, no gradual value discovery. So if you are APM today, think about that chain of mistakes and ask yourself, are we building to impress or building to serve? Look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what do I want to do every day for the rest of my life? Do that. So that was the wild ride of Google Wave, an ambitious, over-engineered, misunderstood product that tried to redefine communication and ended up as a cautionary tale. As product people, it's tempting to chase big ideas, but Wave reminds us big ideas mean nothing without clarity, empathy, and iteration. It's okay to dream big, but build small, validate fast, and respect your user's cognitive load. If you build something that's everything, you often end up with nothing. Thanks for watching Product Chronicles. If you enjoyed this story, hit like, subscribe, and drop a comment. Have you ever shipped a feature nobody used? Or better, what's your favorite product fail we should roast next?